Hi, everyone. Welcome to another network-centric resources online discussion featuring resource developers sharing hard-earned knowledge and lessons learned. So <clears throat> I'm your host. I am the Fab Writer in Fab Writers. Um, we work to build capacity to use tech and data to strengthen advocacy and humanitarian efforts. Um, our network-centric resources project aims to learn from those that are developing people-powered and participatory stuff um, by examining methodologies for sharing ownership, enabling contribution, and supporting collaboration. Our past online discussions have focused on developing content with and for communities and networks, such as um, Soraya Akuda and EFF Security Education Companion, and Heather Leeson with IFRC's Data Playbook or a massive participatory event like our previous discussion we just had with Sarah Allen on MozFest. So today what we're looking at is uh, data standards as a network-centric resource. So how do you motivate organizations to collaborate around developing mechanisms to share information? So joining me today is Greg Bloom from Open Referral. So how are you doing today, Greg? You're on mute. How did that happen? <laughs> I'm there doing really go. well, Dirk. Thanks for having me. Great. So, um, it's, and it's great that you are here. So, why don't we start off? Do you want to do you want to pull up your thing? Let's. We want to give people a a good overview on what is open referral, open referral, sure. what it's its overall objective, and what you're trying to accomplish. Sure. I, I'll pull that up in a sec. First, I'll just introduce myself. And even before that, I want to thank you, Dirk, for for this. This is. Um, as someone who tries to organize networks, I find very little in the way of peer support for that kind of for this kind of work, which is um, for me very intuitive, but also like it's still very difficult. Um, and and you've been a great resource over over the last few years, and, and I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about this stuff. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Greg. Um, so yeah, my um, my name is Greg Bloom. I um, uh, have had like 10 or so years of experience in different nonprofit fundraising capacities, um, but I always found that uh, my avocational interest in essentially organizing ended up sort of hijacking my, my professional work. Um, and at this point, I've just learned, figured out uh, how to merge those, those two interests um, uh, in this project. And so I'll tell you a little bit about it and then some of the ideas behind it. Um, let me see if I can kick this to my deck. Now, uh, I've titled this especially dramatically, Community Resource Directories and the Future of Knowledge and Democracy. My talks really only occasionally um, uh, climb to anywhere near that, that kind of height, so bear with me. Um, and I'm also new to this Zoom functionality, but here we go. Um, so the, I'll give you a little bit of backstory of how I came to eventually start Open Referral, um, which deals with the Community Resource Directory Challenge. Um, I found this problem while working at an organization called Bread for the City, uh, which is one of the main safe, the safety net service providers in the District of Columbia. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that Bread for the City helps people do is, is see the safety net around them. Um, they offer, uh, uh, they have the biggest food pantry in the city, um, a clothing bank, they have a healthcare center, lawyers, they have social workers, um, on top of everything else that they do, the social workers maintain a database of all the other services to which they refer people to. Um, and this database, they built themselves in access. They, main, they maintain it on Friday afternoons. Um, they have dozens of social workers making thousands of calls a week, so they get a lot of information about all the other services to which they're referring people to. And what I discovered was that people were coming to us just because we were known to have the best source of information about where else they might need to go. So this work was essentially increasing our own workload. Um, and then other organizations would come to me. I was the communications guy. And they would ask me, how do we get access to your database? We want to build this website or we want to, you know, we want to build our own database. And my organization was unusually open to sharing, but it seemed to me crazy that, um, first of all, we were doing this on top of everything else that we were doing. There was no other source of this information. Um, and second of all, you know, proliferating copies of this database was actually making the issue worse. Um, and I started asking questions about whether there could potentially be a better way. Um, and what I just discovered was that this is a wicked problem. This problem of who provides what services, um, which, which organizations provide those services, where are they located, how do you access them. Um, 
uh, this is the specific domain that we're working on, and it's like a hundred year old problem that is getting worse um, with the internet. And I'll give you a little bit of a sense of why it's such a problem, and this will come back later when we talk about data standards. This is like my worst slide with so many words on it, um, but that gives you a sense of the complexity. Um, it's not really like, uh, uh, you know, Yelp, where you search for a Chinese food restaurant and you just get the Chinese food restaurants. Like organizations provide many different kinds of services at, many, at multiple locations sometimes in different companies combinations. They have different vocabularies to describe those services based on who's using the words, right? Like the funders use different vocabularies than the managers use than the frontline workers and regular people. Um, and these services are provided across a fragmented landscape of jurisdictions, some nonprofit, some federal, state, and local. Um, and there isn't like a magical open data lever that you can pull somewhere for some executive to say, boom, like all of this information should be available. It's a lot of it is actually private information, even though it's uh, made available by public organizations or publicly funded or tax deductibly funded organizations. Um, and most importantly, it's art is always changing. Um, and uh, uh, when funding changes, organizations change their information. Um, and actually, the, the, the root of this problem is that when organizations are providing services to people who don't pay them for those services, they don't have strong incentives to be found by more people. Um, so they're just not trying to put their information out there and get more clients through the door. It's kind of a, uh, a design flaw in the social safety net. Um, so what has ended up happening as a result of that complexity of this information about who does what, organizations like Bread for the City maintain their own database, sometimes in something like Access, but oftentimes just on a Microsoft Word document or in a spreadsheet or even just a paper binder. Um, and there's a whole field of conventional referral providers, the information and referral field. Um, there's 1,200 some odd accredited referral providers, most of them call centers, most of them nonprofits that are part of the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems uh, um, uh, sort of association. And uh, there's also an emerging field of web-based startups. Um, many of them are trying, describing themselves as the Yelp for social services or Open Table for social services. There's about half a dozen of them. Um, they come and go. Many of them are, are providing premium software directly to like health insurance companies and, 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 and hospitals. Um, and the former, uh, uh, are providing this information on a local basis, and the latter, uh, many of these emerging web products, um, they just scrape the web and munge all that data together and then resell it. Um, and uh, then you have organizations like mine and others who are just trying to build their own localized project products. And this is what that sort of looks like, that mess, right? You have all these different organizations with different tools that they're using to connect people to services. They're all chasing down the same information over and over again in uh, redundant, fragmented silos. And this challenge is more than any one of these organizations tends to be able to cope with on their own, but they're all tackling it on their own. Um, and it becomes this sort of competitive market failure where there's far more efforts to provide this information um, and, and, and yet de demand still only goes up, right? Like it's, it's an undersupplied resource despite how many people are trying to supply it. Um, so uh, just to give you a very quick look at what this actually plays, how this plays out in practice, this is from one of our pilot projects. This is three different sources of information about the same service. They have three different names. I apologize that, the, that it's really blurry. One calls it cats, a woman's place. Another one spells the whole name out. And then a, another one just calls it a women's place. Um, they have different sets of information about how to access this service. And only one of them uh, on the left, um, it's sort of hard to see, but only one of them tells you that uh, it's open 24 hours a week, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but drop-ins uh, intake is only happening between 8 and 4, 4 p.m., 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. on like two specific days during the week, right? So those are the, that's like the most important information that somebody needs to know, and only one of these sources of information got it, and that's just because somebody managed to get the right person on the phone and ask the right question, but all these different groups are chasing down the same data over and over again. Um, so as a result, it's first of all really hard for people to find services. Second of all, it's really hard for people who are providing services to help address complex needs. 
and route people where else they need to go. It's also really hard for people like funders and policymakers to understand what exists out there and then to evaluate, you know, how it's doing and how we could improve the quality of the safety net and improve the health of our communities. If we don't have canonical information about what, what services exists, it's very difficult to evaluate and make decisions about what services should exist. Um, and it's also very difficult for people um, like me, like folks on this call who want to build better tools to be able to innovate because we don't have access to this basic information. Um, so most people, when I talk about this problem, what they tell me to do is to like scrape everybody else's data and build the best app that everybody else will want to use. And, you know, and, and by, by building the best app, we will solve the problem. And that is literally what like very smart people who've been very successful over and over again tell me to do. And they think they're being really savvy while doing it. But it's ultimately just the same logic that got us here. And I'm both like, I'm not, like, I don't think I could do it better than all these other people who have tried and failed. Ultimately, we have to find a different kind of logic if we're going to escape this problem, a different kind of logic from like, let me build the best mousetrap that everybody will use and then we'll solve this problem. We actually have to find ecosystemic solutions that enable many different kinds of systems to survive. So that's our vision is instead of building the best system that everybody will use that many groups have tried and failed to do and really only makes the problem worse what we want is a healthy information ecosystem we want the same information to be accessible through many different channels um, we want different kinds of technologies and different organizational contexts that can work together um, rather than being compete you know being pitted against each other in this um, winner take all competition mode so this is like a really simplified ver version of that vision. It's essentially infrastructure. And infrastructure is a tricky thing, I think, especially for Americans to understand, especially like modern Americans. It's like infrastructure is the thing that enables other things to work, right? Um, but if, if infrastructure is working well, nobody really sees it, right? <laughs> it's invisible. Um, and so what we want is data infrastructure that is interoperable, that many different systems can use to access the same information. Um, now, the question of how we get there, um, this is, you know, a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, breakdown of, of what it will take to actually get to that point where we have that infrastructure. Um, one is we need data standards, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more than usual. I usually don't talk at all about data standards because nobody cares. Um, uh, but the idea is that we, we need common ways of structuring this information. Um, so that all these different systems can actually talk to each other. Um, we need those systems to be quote unquote open, meaning they're designed to integrate with other systems or designed to work together. Um, we need a community of practice that's gonna be able to figure out how to build the above and how to steward it um, as things change. Uh, and most importantly, we need sustainable business models um, uh, because open is not, does not equal magic. We have to actually figure out how these things can, can, uh, can survive over time. Um, so open referral form to pursue those things. But literally, as I was like, asking all these smart people, like, why isn't this a solvable problem? And they're like, well, it is, it, it could, would be a solvable problem if like, if you had a data standard that everybody agreed on. But and then like, 10 times, at least 10 times over the course of two years, when I'm talking to people who really understand the technical dimension of this stuff, which I do not, but I'm like, well, why, why can't we just develop a standard that all these groups can use? the very technical smart people would bring up this comic, specifically this comic over and over again. Um, it comes up all the time when you're talking with technical, especially men um, who are trying to figure out, like if you're trying to figure out how to like avoid the winner take all killer app logic and instead find an ecosystemic approach, they'll be like, well, essentially what they're pointing out here is this collective action problem that Sure, it's nice that you want a standard, but there's all these other standards out there. And if you create another one, now you're just like, you're just replicating that process, which is sort of similar to the pattern of like, everybody wants a community resource directory. Um, and if you build a new one, now you're just one more community resource directory competing for resources. But I actually think that there's a way to change, to escape collective action problems like this. And the key here is the word competing. Right? The situation is that there are 14 competing standards and then the guy's like, oh, well, we need one standard that's gonna actually beat all of the rest of them. Um, and then there's 15 competing standards, but open referral was literally designed 
to enable cooperation across these different standards. There are different standards for community resource directory information. They're designed for different purposes, for different contexts. And Open Referral is saying, actually, we don't need one that's going to do better than all of them. We need one that anybody who might use any one of these standards is going to be able to translate into and out of. Um, and then we actually have to foster that cooperation. Um, uh, and so that, that was the sort of impetus behind open referral was to enable the conventional call centers that have their own standards for transmitting information among call centers and the emerging web. Um, there's a project called schema.org, which is, um, it's a consortium of all the major search engines that agree on standards for marking up structured data on the web so that their search engines can understand how things relate to each other. And in 2013, schema.org proposed a schema for civic services. Basically, some sort of institution provides a service at some sort of location. And the W3C, the World Wide Web Commission, accepted their proposal. So it, back in 2013, there was suddenly a, a default way of structuring this information, information about services, to be indexed on the web. And so I brought the team at Google that worked on that through schema.org into conversation with the folks at the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems, which accredits 211 providers and other hotlines, along with Code for America and several of these startups. Um, we started a conversation saying, hey, in principle, shouldn't all of these different technologies be able to recognize the same language, be able to exchange data. And we got them to say yes, in principle, that sounds like it makes sense and we would support it in principle. Um, and I'm like, great, that's all I needed. And I took it and we started open referral and I ran with the ball. Um, and here I am five years later. <laughs> um, it's been a long road. Uh, I'll get to the progress that we've made, but really quickly, I'll show you one of the early examples of success. This came from Chicago. Um, it was actually a company that was per re recently purchased by one of our other adopters. Um, Purple Binder has now been purchased by Healthify. But they were the first to implement an open referral application programming interface, meaning they took our prototype of an exchange standard, right? Our prototype of a way to structure information about services for sharing among systems. Um, Purple Binder previously was just a private product that they would sell to hospitals for uh, care providers to be able to refer people to social services. But they were getting city funding from the health department in Chicago to collect this information, and they were selling a private product. So they decided they wanted to open up their database so that other organizations could use it for other purposes, right? So it wouldn't just be private data being collected with public funding. So the Smart Chicago Collaborative, which has a health atlas, um, that shows you census data and population health indicators, um, they were able to show services from Purple Binder's open referral API. Um, and they also deployed a public website just for searching this database, which was previously not possible. And then there was a food stamp uh, application that screened you for SNAP benefits, right? And if you weren't eligible for SNAP benefits, it queried Purple Binder's database and showed you pantries in your area that you could uh, uh, go get help at, right? So it's taking data that was previously only used for one purpose and making it available for many purposes simultaneously, which was an early version of, of what success would look like. And since then, we've had a range of organizations that use the open referral format to build their technologies, their, their apps, right? The, the one on the far left was designed by Zendesk as part of their community benefits agreement in San Francisco. Um, it's super simple. It's designed for a librarian to be able to like sit someone down at a library terminal and let them browse or put it on their phone. It's very mobile friendly. Um, the middle one was built by Code for America in San Mateo County. Um, uh, it's, a, it's also mobile friendly, but it's a little more designed around search. The third is a mobile, is a mobile app built by Help Steps um, in Boston. All of these are open source technologies. Anybody can redeploy them if you have data in the open referral format um, and you know, save yourself a quarter million or a half a million dollars not, for not having to build one of these websites from scratch. Um, so that's all successful, but this is the big breakthrough. Oh, and this is my first new slide that I've added to this. And I don't think it's working. Oh, there it is. It's working. <laughs> okay, so after three or four years, 
um, we successfully, actually after five years, the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems formally recognized open referral, our data specifications, our API protocols as emerging industry standards. Um, so after all this work that we've done to show that organizations are adopting this, they're benefiting from it, it's got traction. Finally, the trade association that accredits all of these information and referral providers um, that set standards for the field said this is now a default method of exchanging resource directory information. Um, all of the vendors that serve those 1,200 call centers are now expected to adopt open referral um, for publishing and consuming resource directory data. And the, the, the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems doesn't have hard power. They're going to be monitoring to see whether these vendors have actually adopted it and sort of publishing their report card, um, indicating you know, whether, whether these systems are becoming interoperable or not. So this was... I thought not a very likely scenario, but certainly a best case scenario. Um, and it took me, you know, three times longer than I ever would have uh, imagined. But um, but we got it done, and uh, it's it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem, but it means that we are over the hill, and from here on out, it becomes a lot easier to get cooperation across these many different players um, in terms of just agreeing on the technical structure for sharing this information, uh, which makes it a lot easier to focus on the hard part, which is more along the lines of the social and organizational questions. Um, so really big, really quickly, as, and then I'll start wrapping up. All of this work in developing software and developing open data standards, it's just the necessary but not sufficient step towards solving this problem. The hard part is figuring out how to sustain the production of this information, which requires labor, it requires people making phone calls um, and producing local knowledge. And if we want this information to be a public good, then the question is how can it be sustained, right? How can we sustain its production as an openly available good that costs money to maintain but should be freely available to anybody? Now, that is an answerable question, we have precedence for solving these kinds of problems elsewhere. Having removed some of the technical friction towards finding solutions and then being able to scale those solutions, we're now in a much better place to ensure that we can answer these questions in ways that, that accord with the institutional landscape and the social needs of any given community. Um, so this is an important thing. I don't have a formula for, we have, we have hypothetical models for how to answer this question and I can talk a little bit about that, but we don't have any one set in stone formula because every community has a slightly different landscape and they're gonna have different needs. But our hypothesis is that by helping a handful of communities solve a problem in a way that works for them, we will find um, abstractable tools, and patterns and best practices that can shift the whole market and the whole field. Um, but a lot of our work through open referral is bringing people together from different parts of this wicked problem, bringing together social workers and technologists and policymakers and data scientists and even people searching for services and having conversations. It's a, that is an extremely unpopular thing to do in, um, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, which was one of the places where I started this work, right? Because it's like people just want to build something and see if it works, right? And, and, but, but ultimately what we found is the most valuable insights come when you get different people together in sustained conversation where they're really listening to each other and able to make sense of complex problems in new ways. Um, so just to wrap up, um, this is, you know, on one level, a technical data standards project, right? But really, it's about transforming the way that we allocate resources to meet people's needs. Um, if we're successful, it's not just a matter of helping people find help, um, but it's also a matter of improving the tools by which we do that, um, and even improving the processes of evaluating the performance of these services, evaluating needs of communities, um, and improving our ability to make decisions about how to allocate resources to meet those needs. So um, on one hand, this is super technical stuff about data standards. On the other hand, I, I really look at it as an opportunity for us. It's, it's, it's not necessarily sufficient for us to build the kind of world that I want to live in, but it very well may be necessary. Um, uh, and so 
if you're interested in this stuff, um, you can potentially join a local pilot project or start one depending on your area. I'm happy to talk to, talk to you about like, maybe I know something about what's going on in your community or your field. Um, you may be a technology provider and I'd be happy to talk with you about how your technology can align with these ecosystems. Um, and I'd be glad to chat more. So uh, thanks. I think I might've gone on a little bit longer than intended, but uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion from here. Well, John, and just to say, John, just the fact that you brought Kermit the Frog up into everyone's screen. Right. You know, yeah. you know, I'm going to keep working on that slide. No, that was great. That was, that was really, really great. So um, uh, actually, uh, I just want to remind everyone, if you do want to get our attention, you can use the raised hand. Or as uh, John Mayer has done, you can ask, ask your question there. What I'm going to ask, though, yep. uh, so do, do, do ask questions in the chat room. Great, and, and they're starting to come in. I, what I want to do really quickly before we address those questions, um, Greg, what really got me though in your presentation was, wasn't just Kermit the Frog, though that was huge. Um, the picture of all those people together in the room. Yeah. What I want to know, how did you get, how do you get all these people from all these different contexts, communities and all yeah. that stuff to start working together on you know a potential standard or whatever you want to call how do you get them to work together and come together in that room how did you get them there yeah i mean um it's a good question look for me this is like this is something i i just i discovered before this project that i just instinctively do which is i talk to people I figure out what they're interested in. I try to connect them with other people who share those interests. Um, and I create space for those conversations to happen. Um, and, and so, you know, by the time, by 2013, I had been tinkering with this project, sometimes just as a side, like as a, as a observer for years, just as an observer. And then I tried to actually help with a couple of projects and it'd been five years by 2013 or four years of me learning mostly through failure about the nature of this project of, the, of this problem, but building a network along the way of people who I saw out there in the world who were struggling with it one way or another, and I was learning from them. And then eventually when I saw an opportunity um, to actually bring us together as a network, I just pounced on it. That particular, those particular photos were from our first convening, which was funded by the California Healthcare Foundation, um, because there were, you know, half a dozen different efforts to solve this problem they're floating around the California Healthcare Foundation's network. And I knew half of them, at least personally. And so I was able to say, hey, we have an opportunity to get together and talk to each other past our respective business models or roles. Um, and though generally speaking, I found it very difficult for funders to fund this work. Um, they don't fully understand it, but they do like convenings. Um, and so I was able to pitch like, hey, let's get people together in a room for a couple of days. And like, that was actually one of the easiest pitches I've found um, uh, along the way is like tell a funder that you're going to do a convening and they like that. So I love that. And so it wasn't the like, I'm going to bring, I'm going to kind of uh, actually come up with a bunch of data standards as your like pitch. It was that I'm going to bring together people in a room and yeah. help them solve each other's problems. That's right. Yeah, I, I learned early on actually not to talk about data standards. I've only just recently started again because now we've become like officially endorsed. But if you looked at our website between like when it first launched, maybe I had some language about standards, but almost immediately I'm like, this is a word that carries too much baggage. I, or it's a word that resonates like not at all, right? Yeah. So it was just easier for me to focus on our common goals, which is making it easier to fi share, find, and use this information. Um, uh, and the standards were just the implementation detail of how we get there. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So, uh, John, can I get you to come off mute and, and ask your question? Sure. So, uh, somewhere about uh, early in the uh, presentation, you said, um, oh, man, you were talking about referral providers yeah. being accredited. I don't know who, who does the accreditation or is it the, uh, the that, uh, Alliance for Information and Referral folks? Yeah, so the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems, AIRS, is like a 40-year-old organization. Um, and uh, they predate 211. 211 is like the official hotline for resource referral. Um, but, excuse me, they, they sort of, they, um, I think they, they license 
official referral providers and resource specialists. So they actually do training and licensing for the people who do the work of maintaining this information and making referrals. Um, and I think they do, I've gotten in trouble for saying this wrong before, um, so, I, I, so asterisk, but um, uh, they, they essentially like make the standards and, and certify that referral providers are abiding by those standards. Great. Um, Javier, can I ask you to come off mute and, and ask, you can ask both those questions. Oh. Oh, I think Javier's unfortunately frozen um, and has gotten off his thing. I, we will come back to Javier if he shows back on. Um, let's jump to Liz, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I was curious to see, like, with your looking backwards, what the early indicators were that um, this was becoming an industry standard um, before you got, like, the seal of approval. <laughs> yeah, so... Um... I think a couple, so first of all, the, the market leader for call center software, their name is iCarol. They have almost half of the field and they were the first to adopt open referral. Um, but that happened a while ago. Um, it was, and, and it was interesting game theoretically to think about like, would you basically the, the game of data standards is like, like everybody benefits if everybody cooperates, right? But it costs any individual organization to, to adopt a data standard. One way or another, it, it's, the cost is non-zero. Um, so nobody really wants to be the first. Um, and it was really interesting that iCarol stepped up to be the first because they were the, the, they were the youngest in their field, but as they had been a startup and they had captured this field of call centers, and that field is quickly seeing the writing on the wall that call centers are not sufficient. They're not sustainable in and of themselves. So iCarol was like, we don't want to lose this field that we just want. And they were like, we're going we're gonna to move in the direction that we see the web going. Um, so that was the key, was like just the big player in their field adopted it. Um, but the other, the other big one, I think, is we started getting governments to adopt it. Um, we started getting, getting governments to say, you know, we're going to start publishing data about the services that we fund in our format. New York City was the big one. Um, New York City Mayor's Office started putting out data about their, their contractors. Um, and we also had at least one or two funders um, say, we want our grantees information to be available in this format. Um, and so, uh, and then, you know, we had other, a steady stream of other organizations just adopting it, a lot of which was just me building relationships with them and, and building some measure of trust and then being like, I want to tell your story, right? Um, and then the big one, I actually think the most important thing that I did was I went to their meetings and I talked to them over and over again. I just like, I socialized and they did not want me there. They were not happy that I was there. But after five years, I, I built enough relationships and I had enough conversations where it's like, what, what I started hearing back was like, they think that he gets, he understands us. He understands what we're trying to do. Um, and that was really important when, when it came up, like, I think they were suddenly facing a situation where they knew they had to do something and we had done a lot of this work that they should have been doing themselves. Um, and they had tried a couple of times and for a variety of reasons, they hadn't been successful. And when the time came, they were just like, you know what, we support this. And it was a big, it was a big breakthrough. Great. I love that. And I, I so I have to just make a quick pop culture reference. Um, as Liz, Lizzo says in her song, um, Juice, if I shine, everybody gonna shine. And I think that's the bit with open referral. If open referral shines, everybody that's involved with open referral yes. shines and the standard. I've never thought of this work in terms of shine theory, but that is, uh, I don't know that I'm gonna claim that, uh, but, but I appreciate the reference. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. Um, great, Bob. Uh, Gretek, do you want to come off a uh, mute and, and ask your question? Yeah. Um, so in some of our conversations about sharing data about providers, um, some of the organizations that we talk to um, have been initially hesitant because they're afraid that if the provider data gets out there, uh, somebody's going to pick it up and not do a good job. And how have you encountered that or dealt with that? Yeah, you know, out of all the kinds of resistance that people throw up at me, that is the one that I have the hardest time um, uh, empathizing with. Um, that's the one that I, that I find a really, that, that's actually the, the one that's like, I find really objectionable. Um, 
And that's not to say, I understand where they're coming from, right? This information is complex. It is easy to get it wrong. But I think the right answer to that is like produce better information and support the development of better designs, right? Rather than withhold this information from the public because you don't think they're smart enough to use it effectively. Um, but yeah, like it can be tricky, right? You put out information about the, the shelters, right? Um, the homeless shelters in a city and, you know, shelters all across the city. But if you're not reading the, the records carefully, you might miss that actually you've got to go to this one office in order to access any of those other shelters, right? Yeah. And that information, if it's not really clear, you could send somebody on a wild goose chase that somebody is in a bad situation, it's dangerous, right? So it is important to be promoting correct information. But I think the answer to that, to the concern that the information will be misused is to improve the quality of the information and improve the way that it's delivered. But not to say people should not have this information, or only professionals should be able to use this information. It's this is public information about publicly provided or, or tax deductibly funded services. And I, people just get like, I, that's the one that I find a real hard time, like really uh, addressing people's concerns. If ultimately what they're just saying is I should be the gatekeeper. Um, you know, sometimes people just don't want to cooperate. And what I've found is the, the challenge of this work is just to find the people who do want to cooperate and help them win. Cool. Thanks. Um, Javier, thank, welcome back, sir. Um, can you come off mute and ask your questions? Ah, you're still on mute. Let me see if I can get you off mute. I'm unmuting you. No, no, on mute. Okay. Yeah, there you Hello go. there. It's a oh. great discussion, I guess, uh, coming from the geospatial environment because uh, we usually have these kind of issues we have to use databases mostly for humanitarian issues. So my question was about how is this different from the spatial data infrastructure that have been going on in many institutions, mostly geographic, and that has to do with these developments that are being done for the humanitarian scenario. For instance, there's the AHDX initiative and they have their own standard and they work like and it would be nice that we hear their, their point of view in future emissions of these kind of discussions. But they, they usually have this platform where they have their different standards, but they resume them in a whole platform. So my question was, how, how could you learn or how could you teach to other kind of infrastructures that are being done in this way, mostly the ones from the spatial origin? Um, so, first of all, I think the, um, we're providing information about organizations, the services they provide, the locations that they're at, right? Now, there are other standards for similar kinds of information that, like, are tangential to that domain, right? And they bump up right against it. And really, one of my objectives is aligning with the existing standards and infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and so geospatial standards and infrastructure is one of those things, right? The location of services, not all services, some services are virtual or based on the phone, but the location of services, we want this information to be out there in our standard because we also know that once it's out there, it's gonna be easy to align with the geospatial standards and infrastructure that can help people figure out specifically where to go and how to, how to get there, right? Um, but they're, they're sort of like, uh, where the objective is to join our domain to other domains, right, for different purposes. Um, I think you mentioned the, the HDX, I think that's the Humanitarian Data Exchange developed by the UN. Um, they also work with uh, a, a, a sort of lightweight approach to metadata standards that I believe is called Hexel, Humanitarian Exchange Language. And that's an example, early on we had a group that took open referrals data model and flattened it um, so it could fit in a spreadsheet and then translated it to Hexel, right? Um, so one could, I, I mean, you know, the work still has to be done, but one could take a directory, translate it into or out of open referral, load it with Hexel into potentially the humanitarian data exchange. Um, it's all possible. Getting it done is a matter of like finding a prioritized situation where the work can actually like, you know, happen. Um, and I'm still looking for those in the international aid, aid field. 
Um, and so, you know, I'd be glad to follow up off thread because uh, we do have a, a few other folks who are, who are in the, that domain, like Peace Geeks is building an app and I know that they've done a lot of work in, the, in that field. Um, so I'd be glad to follow up. Great, and let me just encourage uh, that connection to happen, Greg and Javier. Um, uh, more, can I ask you to come off mute and ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, hi. I had a bunch of questions from the UK of like, if they want to start something like open referral, how they do it? And I speak mostly about government because most of the time, and it's not a bad thing, but I mostly have a US examples to show them of implementation. Um, and I think most data people in government, or most government people are not like, bad with data, they're just afraid of it. So what are the best way of like showing this to them? So first off, great question. First I'll preface this by saying, I think open referral has a lot of work to do to make, to provide tools and, 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 and guides um, that can make it easier to get started. Uh, um, it's definitely not like the learning curve, the learning curve is significant. Like all this is open. Like anybody could sit down and figure it out, but yes, like ideally we'd, we'd have like, you know, I, I've long wanted like a picture book, you know, or like a, you know, a little, gra a little graphic novelette where, where like you could actually see the different ways that a community might work together. But to, since, since I'm still working on figuring out how to build those things, um, the, I actually think what I try to do is find at least a hypothetical loop of value, right? Where it's like, it's not just I have somebody who might be willing to publish data in the open referral format. It's also like, I have somebody who wants to use that data and we're able to get them in conversation and at least scope out like that shared value proposition on a piece of paper, ideally on a page. To, to be able to direct people's attention, right? Because when it, when it comes to like getting started, this is complex and you could really get started in any number of places. And presumably you wanna get started with a sense of where you wanna go to deliver value as early as possible to someone, right? In order to generate more capacity and more buy-in to, to deliver more value in the future. You know, once, once you figure it out, who wants to use the data that might be published in the open referral format, then there's more technical steps of like, you know, that, that data presumably is available, hopefully in like in some sort of structured way. And if it's available in that structured way, then mapping the fields to our fields um, is like your first step figuring out how the vocabularies align and where there's divergence and then troubleshooting that divergence and then writing the scripts to start transforming data from one format to another, loading it. And we have a couple of, you know, examples of websites that you could easily deploy if you have data in this format just to demonstrate what's possible. But usually I try to figure out how can we do the least amount of work to demonstrate this concept in order to get more resources to do more work. Great. Um, so we, we are moving on in the time and, and um, Bob, you are gonna have to forgive me because I am going to jump the queue and ask a couple of questions that I wanna make sure that we got in. Um, so let me ask those and then we'll see where we are at in terms of time. But basically, Greg, hmm, I know this has been like a good chunk of your life for the last decade. And obviously um, you are not uh, driven by the money. So, or, or maybe you are, um, and it's just gonna come later, but I just wanted you to touch on principles and values that are motivating you and that have kept you, um, and perhaps sleeping on people's couches and things like that yeah. um, in this. You know, what is, <clears throat> what, what's, what's kept you going? What's, what's really made you uh, apply yourself in, in getting this done? Yeah, I mean, so the principles and values of open referral are well established and um, in fact that was the first thing I did before launching open referral was like I think there's an opportunity here and I'm going to write down the principles and values that might guide our thinking about this opportunity um, the values of open referral are you know accessibility of this information um, the uh, reliability of the information the sustainability of this information and, and interoperability is a value that like it should be able to work with different systems. Um, and uh, you know, our, our principles, which is like how we get, how we guide our work are like, Oh, you know, things should be open by default. We should, um, the user's prerogative should guide our thinking. Um, we should, you know, kindness and respect, you know, there are, these are, these are the principles and the values that I laid out to, to sort of, 
essentially draw about a border around what it is that we're talking about. And, and this was just something I sort of instinctively did maybe a really wonky thing to do. Uh, but what I found was it was actually tactically really important that as I was talking with people who were skeptical about what we were doing, right? And I think like Bob asked a question about like, well, what, what if people like get this information and, and make the make, you know, and misinterpret it. And it's like, well, one of our values is that this information should be reliable. Right. It should, you know, that's, that's, and, and when people are like, well, how are we going to, you know, to continue operating if we're giving away our data? We're like, well, you know, one of our values is that we're about sustainability. So like, that's a really important question that we want to put front and center. Right. And being able to describe those values and those principles in language that is going to resonate with everybody. First of all, that was only possible because I'd had years of talking with people about what they cared about. So I was able to just look through that and pick out the patterns that really applied to everybody across the board. But it also helped them understand like, okay, if we're talking about open referral, we're talking about these things, right? Um, and in terms of, uh, that, and by the way, I think that's actually really important for any kind of open network to do um, is like, uh, the openness of resources, the openness of networks is actually potentially a source of vulnerability right? Um, like if you want a valuable resource that's lot, that lots of people are going to share, you have to put boundaries around it, right? You have to be able to say, here's what's inside this resource. And here's, and in order for be, you to be able to say, this is what's out, right? And if it's an open network, your principles and your values are really one of your only strengths, or your only tools of establishing those values, those, those boundaries, right? Um, in terms of my own personal, you know, principles, I could, you know, go on about that for longer than the time that we have, but, you know, ultimately it's like, I do th like, I, I think the era of open data as a, as like something that is like, a, like something that's inherently good. I think that era is over. Right. Um, uh, I, that's not to say we shouldn't do open data, but there is no reason to assume that if you do open data, good things happen. Right. Yeah. It's insufficient. Right. My, my, the values and principles that guide my work are about cooperation, right? I assume that generally speaking, we get better results when people cooperate with each other um, about um, essentially like deliberation and discovery that like we're creative agents, we can find, you know, solutions to problems. Um, and I actually find that these values do, they, they are sort of like everybody, sh everybody just, Many people have them inside, but our culture sort of papers over them and tells us this actually isn't true. Cooperation isn't possible. You know, people aren't creative. Um, only like entrepreneurs really can can innovate. And I find that to be really problematic. And so I don't talk about it all that much, but open referrals work really on, on some way, it, on some level is trying to show that like actually cooperation not only is possible, but it's preferable. Um, and if we solve it in this domain of like, how are we allocating resources? How are we tracking information about how we allocate resources to meet people's needs? If we can solve it here, maybe there are like effects that can ripple out and be even you know valuable even outside of this domain. That, that works. Thank you so much. Um, I just you know I want to reiterate because I think the um, there's so much there in, in what you just said. One of the things that was actually heartbreaking for me to be reminded of while I was watching your presentation um, was that service providers now are often privatized, right? Yeah. And it is private companies and it is that mindset of, you know, we've got to compete. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, it is not that uh, unusual that people that are working on standards are thinking that the standards are going to be competitive, right? Um, and so I think that bit in terms of, you know, what I love is that you're, it, it's the bit of like, wh when can we remind people that it's not just about the money and actually with health and human services, this is really about people's lives, right? And it is about um, being able to have more effective impact, being able to, to meet need in a better way and not have it just be about some service providers bottom line in terms of like whether or not they've made profit, right? To, to, to punctuate that a little bit though, yeah. it is also about the money, right? I have like open referral does not assume that good intentions and, and ethical expostulation will solve this problem. We need to show that 
different approaches that treat this information as public information are also strategically smarter for one's business. Yeah. Right? We do need to show that organizations are going to enhance their bottom line by, by doing the right thing. And I think that is certainly possible, although it does require stepping back from some of the easy concepts that we have about how to become sustainable, about how to develop a business model. There are superficial approaches that are usually extractive and harmful to people and communities, and you do have to do a little bit more work to find sustainable models that are actually generative, that preserve people's agency and, and, and autonomy, um, and that, that create more possibility rather than trying to box it into your you know, Google uh, mousetrap, right? So um, it still is about like the bottom line, and also we can get there by thinking about like what's actually best for everybody. Great. Um and also just John, John Mayer, your point about nonprofits competing too, boy, do we know that. Um, but it's yeah. still, you know, very much under the, the, the um, uh, money paradigm. Anyways, um, I know people are logging, are starting to log off. And I just need to quickly say thank you, everyone, for participating today. Just a reminder, these things are... Um, uh, we hold these monthly, and if you are working on a network-centric resource and you want to share your uh, challenges and lessons learned by guesting in an um, um, upcoming online discussion, do get in touch with me. If you are not part of the network on network-centric resources, you can join at fabwriters.net forward slash network-centric. Big thank you, Greg. Thank you so much for all your hard thank you. work. Um, we will be having another online discussion next month. Thursday, March 21st at uh, 1600 GMT, where we will be joined by more Rubenstein. Yay, there she is, um, uh, who's going to be talking about lessons learned from forming Open Heroines, a global network of women who work in the fields of open government, open data, and civic tech. Um, just a reminder, this online discussion will be made available on YouTube, and I'll be posting notes from the discussion along with the live online recording um, soon on the FAB blog, on the FAB Writer site. Also, on the theme of data, and apologies, I will be done in just two seconds. Um, are you at all interested in data literacy and sharing methodologies on how to convene it? We're convening a data literacy consortium, and the first meeting will be one week from today, Wednesday the 27th at 1500 GMT. If you're interested, you can see the FAB Writer's website, and I will also include a link to RSVP in the notes and all that. I'm glad to see the connections. Also glad, thank you everyone for what you wrote in the chat room. I'll be using that in my notes. And with that, I am going to let, every, I'm going to stop the recording and let everyone go. Um, thank, unless, you, thank you, sir. Thank you. I really appreciated that, Greg.